Yeah, we're about 23 degrees Celsius. Hello and welcome <laughs> to the Gooners podcast. Uh, Mike, we're doing a lot of these. I know. Well, because this is exhausting. It's kind of like when you don't have to talk about football, we shine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, speaking of shining, and, and Mark, I, I, I apologize. This is rude, but I have to cover this. Uh, take those headphones off, Andy, because someone looks like they're trying to copy someone, except is doing a better job of, of you know. I posing trippy. You know, so I, I can straight out throw my hair if it grows long, and I hate it. And I, I, I had clippers, and my mom said, well, I'll cut them this weekend. So went into the backyard. She cut the hair. And I thought to myself, I've missed a two-week span of where I can tell people I'm going to shave my head like you did yeah. and then freak out about it as close you, as I get to you, it. You could have sold that for charity. Um, we could have – I could have had the joke to say, who's going to cut you? Who cut your hair, man? Your mom? And and uh, and and I, and I wouldn't even have known. But let's let's. This is rude. Uh, let's everyone in in, Sorry, in, in chat, uh, please uh, comment. Use your questions about Andy's hair. Uh, can he can he grow a beard? The answer is no. So he can never quite be like me. I was going to put this up here. Uh, your biggest fan, David Ziegler, uh, has uh, has posted in here. Uh, let's introduce our guest. Uh, our guest today is a man who grew up on the mean streets of Greenwich. Um, I believe. If I'm not wrong, uh, and maybe this wasn't at the same time, but it went to the same school as former Arsenal player and future podcast guest David Hillier. Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah, I was there. Oh, my research was it the he's, same time? He's younger than me. I know you won't believe that, but he's younger than me. I can't. I can't believe that. You must have. Uh, you must have skipped a few grades, as we call it over yeah. here. But, yeah. um, but thank you for joining us, Arsenal's supporters liaison officer, uh, Mark Brindle. Uh, been after you for a while, and I appreciate you finally joining us. And, yes. You know, we, we just couldn't nail you down for a time, and finally, uh, finally, we got lucky, right? <laughs> so, explain to yeah, everyone well, it, what the bit quieter these days, isn't it? So, <laughs> explain to everyone what the liaison supporter does. Wow, way to jump right into that nope. <laughs> instead of going with my format. <laughs> yeah, cut it. Go Sorry, ahead. I didn't hear that. Not read the format saying. of this podcast. No, I read the format. I just don't see in here where we ask him what that is. So I'm okay. curious what the supporters liaison officer does. Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't, didn't, yeah. Um, well, the, the main fact thing of the uh, SLO is it, it's the link between the club and the fans. Um, every club has to have a, an SLO within UA for rules and regulations. Um, I think the sort of main premise of it is that we try and make sure that all supporters have uh, a great day at the game. We can't affect the result, obviously, but if they have issues, um, then we're there to try and help them home and away. Um, I go to every single game. So um, building up a strong connection with a lot of uh, supporters around the world and um, just really working towards uh, making everything run fairly smoothly. But it's not just me. I'm part of the team. Uh, I'm in the um, Tessel team, which is travel events and support liaison. And uh, there's a big group of us. Um, uh, big shout out to those guys who I hope are listening. And um, you know, it's um, very much a team effort. So Mark, tell us Mark, about your uh, with us uh, with him to, to to listen to our podcast, get those numbers up, get those. The views. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us, how did you yeah. become an Arsenal supporter? What age did you uh, become a Gooner, and and how did that relationship start? Well, my granddad was from um, the Old Kent Road, which is a very uh, well, it was it's a very tough part, and um, it's very much a Millwall area. Um, but he mm. um, he he loved his football, and he was Millwall and Arsenal. Um, my granddad was a fantastic storyteller. Um, he used to tell me all stories of his uh, trials and tribulations during the, the war. And But he also used to tell me great stories about the 1930s Arsenal side, um, Ted Drake and Alex James and all those people. And uh, so that sort of lodged in my mind. And I got to when I was about seven and um, there was an inkling that I might be a Chelsea supporter. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my granddad took me, took me to Arsenal and um, it was very much like the film Fever Pitch when he walks out into the West End uh, into the sunlight 
and that day was very similar to that. And that was it, 1970 uh, against Man City. We lost 2-1. Sammy Nelson scored for Arsenal. And two from Aguero, and, right? Uh, and that was it, really, ever since then. Yeah, yeah. I know that. Excellent. And so, then, <laughs> so you are connected through the Essex Supporters Club. Tell us how that involvement happened, the size, scope of running a group, I'm assuming – quite large yeah well it, it was re when it first started it was the south essex because essex is is quite a big county i mean what nothing to the size of your guys states and what have you but uh for us mm. it was quite a big county and um we um we noticed really that there wasn't a, a branch of the supporters clubs in essex so there was a couple of us me and a guy called ian harold um, and we got together and uh, with the help of a few others, formed it from there. Um, like a lot of the English clubs, uh, a lot of it was to do with ticketing. Um, and um, But we, we did expand on that. We did big family days. Uh, I always remember once we did a, a, a training session for sort of our junior members in a, a local park. And we had about 100 kids all in Arsenal gear. And, uh, I mean, Essex is a pretty strong West Ham area. And um, I'm standing by the side watching the Arsenal coaches put, put these young lads through their paces. And uh, this guy comes storming over to me, very concerned. He, and he was like, what's going on here? And I, I mean, it's like a training session for all the kids. What are all these Arsenal fans doing here? And he said, this is West Ham country. <laughs> and I said, well, if West Ham can't like organise, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that that was quite funny. But yeah, it's, so we, you know, five six hundred members, big social events, um, and um, really, that's how I got to know about it came up because um, we we was told that Jill Smith, who you no doubt know, um, was retiring, and uh, sort of I went from there really. Yeah, and that that segues nicely into uh, the story of how you got the job, which which I've I've read another uh, article uh, that that learned a little bit more about. It. I think the story is fascinating. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this, Mark, but you didn't always work for the Arsenal. Uh, I know all of our listeners do, but um, you were in the financial services industry for a while, much like myself. Uh, yeah, except, unlike myself. Oh, here we go, making it all you, about Mike. Came, you, lived, you lived the dream and you got out um, yeah. and uh, escaped into a career with your first love, which, of course, is the Arsenal. So um, the story about the day you interviewed with the job, uh, for, you know, for that job, uh, tell us a little bit more about yeah. it. It's, it's a good story. Yeah, yeah well, there had been a sort of series of interviews building up to it. And, and then um, um, uh, Sue Campbell is who's my boss now as well, um, I was down to the final three uh, and I had to do a present people, senior guys um, come within the club. And uh, um, so I, I was the third lady to me, right, I'll, I'll take you out of the office now. And as we're walking out, she said to me, um, we'll let you know on Monday, this was Thursday, she said, because it's been quite long drawn out and we know, you know, you're waiting for a decision. And uh, so I thought, fair enough. And as we got out to the lifts at Highbury House, um, they weren't very in good order in those days. And there was always one broken down. So on this day, there was one broken down. So we had to wait quite a while for the lift. And as we're standing there, the doors open to where all the director's offices are. And um, out walks Ken Fry. And uh, first of all, Liam Brady comes out. Liam Brady comes out and Sue introduces me to Liam and Liam's one of my old great heroes, uh, probably my second favourite player of all time. And um, he, uh, so we're chatting away and I thought, oh, this is quite, this is good. And then the doors opened again and Ken Fryer came out, who's Mr Arsenal, uh, and uh, he's with Frank McClintock. And uh, now my son's called Frank. Um, my wife thinks he's named after Frank Sinatra but I can assure you he's named after Frank McClintock. Um, and um, so, and here I am, I'm 
I'm with Frank Sinatra. Still waiting for this lift to come. The lift's taking Andy ages. named his son again he's... after Giroud, so it's okay. You win that one. Yeah. He's, he's, t- he's telling me um, uh, all about his new golf swing and everything like that. So I remember getting outside Highbury House after all this. I remember standing there thinking, well, that was just surreal. And I, I literally thought, if I don't get the job, I've still met Frank McKintock and Liam Brady and been in the sure. lift with them. Like, it was really, you know, like, you know so. And um, so I've gone home and I live out in the outskirts, about 45 miles away from the ground. And so I've got on a commuter train going home and I'm sitting there, my phone's gone and it's an un- unknown number. And I thought it was maybe somebody trying to sell me something. So I just, I binned it straight away. And um, and then it's rang again. And I thought, oh. All right. And it's still, um, I, I, I thought to myself, I must have left something at the office. Um, you know, that, there can be no other reason she's calling in. So I've answered and she said, Mark, are you sitting down? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and she said, are oh, you somewhere quiet? And I said, no, sir, I'm on a train back to Chelmsford. Um, there's no quiet places on here. It's packed. And she said, um, well, we can't wait until Monday. We thought we'd let you know you've got the job. So mm-hmm. it's all gone silent. And Sue's going, Mark, are you there? Are you there? And I, I'm just like welling up. And um, <laughs> and then I finally managed to talk. And, and she said, so come in on Monday and we'll tell you all about what's going to happen, etc." And I'm like, oh, thank you, Sue. You know, such great news. And uh, and then uh, all these people were looking at me on the train and was like, what's the matter with that weirdo there? And um, I thought, I've got to tell the wife. And so I thought, I can't ring her because I'll just burst out into tears. And uh, so I texted her, sent her a text. And and it was school half term. And my younger boy, who's Freddie, three guesses who he's named after, um, <laughs> was on his uh, skateboard, on the skateboard park with his mate. And his mate said to him, Fred, is, you, is your mum okay? And he's turned around, and my wife, Debbie, is jumping up and down and going mad. And Fred just turned around and said, yeah, she's always like that, and carried on <laughs> skateboarding. So we, we had quite, quite a good party um, that last that night. I'm, I'm guessing he was named after Freddie Sinatra, uh, first yes, of all. Yeah, that, yeah the lesser known brother. My guess. Yeah, I, I have a few. I have a few questions for you about this story. First of all, this was in uh, in 2014, if I'm if I'm correct. What, um, what were, what, yeah, yeah. What were Liam Brady and and Frank? I mean, with, is this is is Highbury House like a pub where they're just like all the legends? Like they just have nowhere else to go. They just hang out there. Yeah, they just come. They come in. Well, Liam was still working on the academy at the time, so he was a regular in the office. Um, and Frank, yeah, he comes back and they talk about you know doing things with the old. Liam. And, and and there's charity work they get involved in. Um, so you, you do see Frank about a bit. I mean, he's always at the game, um, you know, and, um, yeah, a good, good, good bloke, proper Arsenal man. Okay. Next question is, um, in that presentation that you gave to them for the job, did you have a PowerPoint and dossiers like Unai Emery? Or, like, it seems like you're still doing the interviews the same way. Seems like a general well, theme that just to get a job at Arsenal, you just need to know how to work PowerPoint and you're in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this yeah. isn't to take well, away from their obvious attraction uh, that they had. I mean, they love themselves a presentation. You know, I, I'd be I had to do quite a quick crash course on that. And um, it was, um, uh, yes. Yeah, Steep learning curve on that side, but I did a presentation on building Arsenal uh, overseas. So, so this is quite appropriate now, I suppose that we're, we're talking to you guys. Yeah. Well, I'll tell, I'll tell you, given that given that timing, uh, May of 2014, if my research is correct, um, number one, that was right before the FA Cup final against Hull. So. Uh, our, you basically got there and we started winning silverware. Are you considered Mr. Silverware amongst your, your peers? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a quiet start to the job. Yeah. Okay. So, it was, um, that was a great day, obviously. And, um, you know, it's, I think the pressure the club was under at the time, um, and they turned it around. And yeah, well, fantastic. You, you turned it around. You turned it around, Mark. Yeah, um, that's it. I, I, I'm not changed when I joined. 
Exactly. You, you're Mr. Silverware. And, and of course, that summer was the first uh, Arsenal tour in in some 35 years or 25 years or so to the States, uh, a, a quick one to New York. Uh, since then, you've been back twice. I know you've been to, you know, the, the, the club's gone to a lot of places over the summer. So, again, uh, when it comes to re- reconnecting with international fans, uh, if that if you've got even 10 percent to do with that, and I have a feeling it's a lot more than that. Uh, you've done your job well. Um, so congratulations on uh, getting the job six years in. You never know. Next time I might, I might get out to visit you in the next time. Hey, you know, if you were in D- you were, were you in D.C. this summer? When the no, team- no, I wasn't actually. They no, it was, uh, you know, they can only take so many people and um, um, I wasn't high enough up on the list, I suppose. Uh, um, I'm quite interested in um, Gunagar. I, 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 I quite fancy that one. You should be quite interested in that. Uh, it's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. Should I bring the wife? Or? Uh, I go. I alternate. One year I bring her. I mean, she. There's nothing. <laughs> I, there's nothing oh, I can't. Can. There's nothing I can't. Can. Yeah, I, I'm not up to any shenanigans. I just. Uh, <laughs> it seems to have alternated from one year to the next. Apologize to, to to everyone watching on YouTube for some of the technical issues that we're having, but um, but I'm uh, certainly enjoying everything that Mark's uh, having to say. Uh, sorry, Andy, up to, up to you. No, so Mark, how does Arsenal look into your or their non-playing staff during the hiring process? Does it work in a person's favor? How crazy of a supporter they are? Does it depend on the depend on the position they're hiring for? Yeah, I, I think some people think that the um, you know being an Arsenal fan would be a prerequisite uh, and um, for for joining, but Arsenal will always recruit the best person they can for the job. Um, there's some great people in there that don't support Arsenal. Um, it's quite interesting that after a while, though, they they tend to you know say things like we won the match at the weekend and. Things like that, so you keep you sort of catch them out a little bit. Um, you know, soon get into the the Arsenal uh, way. Um, so um, yeah, I don't I don't think you have to be a crazy gooner. I mean, we we've even got Spurs fans working in Highbury House, so um, that that, that says a lot. Yeah, that is surprising. I I would never have thought that. By the way, as if the technical issues weren't enough, we've had plumbing issues in our house recently, and about about once every five minutes or so. We get this loud. I don't know if you can hear it through the oh, mic. Yeah. We get this we get yeah. this loud, uh, horrid sounding noise. So uh, if we weren't already the most professional outfit you've ever uh, been interviewed by, Mark, then uh, you know we should seal that deal. Um, as I just mentioned in the chat, if you've got any uh, questions for Mark, uh, this is a great time to to put them in the chat. We've got a fairly open slate uh, coming up in the user question area, so please. Feel free, but uh, you know I'm I'm stunned. We got we got Spuds working in Highbury House for Arsenal. I would have never. I mean, even in in the worst of job markets, I would have never thought that was the case. So since my recent trip to London, uh, you know, we tried in, in this podcast to focus on kind of some more interesting areas, non-playing areas, uh, play some silly games, topics. Try not to dwell on the situation that's going on in the world and football, but uh, and you know, the Premier League, what's what's going to happen with that? But we really kind of have to at least ask a question today, uh, while we have you with us in your in your valuable position as being a a member of the staff of Arsenal, the the as we call it, the non-playing staff of Arsenal. So, uh, by the way, it was great to meet you in the lobby of of, of the Highbury House. I appreciate you uh, coming down and 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 doing what you did to help out our our charity, Gunners versus Cancer. I take it you're not working in the office these days. You're working remotely, or is that yeah, essential? that's it. So we, we, we were sent home um, uh, over two weeks ago now. So, um, yeah, so we're all, all working from home. The stadium's all closed down. Um, you know, I think they're just planning to cut the grass, basically. What does Frank McClintock do with his time now that he can't come in and visit you? Say that again? What does Frank McClintock do now that he doesn't have oh, the ability yeah, to come yeah. and say hi? Yeah, well, uh, you know, he's. Uh, I don't suppose he can even play golf now. He, he does like a round, round of golf. So, uh, uh, um, so just like all of us, we're we're staying in and staying safe at the minute. 
hard times, man. Hard times. So yeah, yeah. obviously we, we've seen a lot of publicity in the last week or two. Uh, not great publicity surrounding uh, a number of clubs, including uh, our, our neighbors, uh, as well as Liverpool, who's kind of made a decision, then backtracked off it about how they've addressed their non-playing staff. It's, it is a yeah. sad reality that these things um, are public and, and, and up for opinion these days, but uh, no comment on what, you know, from Arsenal on what they plan to do. Um, you know, what do you know? What are you allowed to discuss? Uh, any opinions on how this is all playing out, given your unique uh, Really, stance? to be honest with you, um, there's, there's not a lot to discuss. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, so they, 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 no, that's a- they, yeah, there's not a lot to discuss. Really, we, you know, we, we're never going to comment on what other clubs do. To be, to be frank, I, I'm not particularly interested in what they're doing. Um, I think from our side of things, I, you know, I have faith that the the club will look after us and and act in an Arsenal way. So, um, but I know as little as, or as much as you do. What I would say is. Um, don't believe all you read in the press and the social media. Well, I certainly think that's advice worth worth taking in general. Um, you know, people react very strongly without knowing everything a lot of the times. But you know, obviously, yeah. um, uh, in your position, we certainly hope that uh, that your employer, the, the the owners of our of our beloved club, mm-hmm. think what you like of them. My hope is that that they will continue the Arsenal way and take care of their own people. Um, so yeah. we're, we're out there, uh, thinking about you. So as a supporters liaison officer, I noticed that the word club is not necessarily after supporters. It's not necessarily the supporters club liaison officer. So would you say you're primarily in, in charge of coordinating with supporters clubs around the world, like Arsenal America and, and the Arsenal supporters club in London and, and, and overseas, or is it just supporters in general? And how do those two roles kind of inter- intertwine? Well, it is, it is supporters in general, um, but I do, you know, I do look after all the supporters clubs um, as part of the role. Uh, we've got about 185 worldwide now. Um, I was talking to some guys in uh, Algeria today um, about potentially setting up a club there. Um, so, um, so yeah, it is part of what I do, um, but it's it's not the whole thing. So, because you know, on match days. I'm more involved with um, people at the ground and things like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, really trust. Um, uh, Acer as well. So all the different groups. Uh, so you, you work a lot with Tim and Akil from the Supporters Trust on, even, even though the, the, the yeah, role yeah, of the trust is Yeah, definitely. I mean, I used to be on the board of the trust. Um and obviously I had to step down when I got the role at Arsenal. Um, so I've known Tim for a very, very long time. Um, and uh, I got to know Kiel recent years. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're good guys. Um, they've got uh, the interests of the club at heart and they're true, true supporters. So it's always a pleasure working with them because they're passionate. Um, you know, sometimes we can't do everything they want. Um, and you know that's quite coming from a supporter side originally. Um, you know that could have been a problem when I got the role in that you know I have to say no at times to people, especially people you've worked with for a long time previously. Um, but they understand that, and um, you know we all get on well. That's great. And you know when I first joined Arsenal America, which was my first supporters club experience, um, I had no. I envision this being, you know, just a, gr- a group of Arsenal fans uniting remotely with no connection to the club. I mean, I just never really thought of the breadth of the, the relationship between the club and its supporters, which obviously you and, and your role and your predecessor has a lot to do with. But, you know, we were quickly reminded by a very uh, a certain person running the supporters club at the time who liked to kind of constantly remind us and tell us what we could and couldn't do. Um, that there's a lot of, you know, but for better or for worse, it, it did kind of reestablish the fact that there is a lot of communication between the club uh, through you and, and the supporters clubs around the world. So, um, you know, we know that you're involved in posting banners around the stadium. I would imagine you have some in, some input and 
guidance on the summer tours. But I mean, tell us, uh, kind of picking up on where Andy's question left off. Um, you know, what are your day to day? You know, are there areas besides kind of banners and summer tours and other communication? I mean, clearly, clearly, there's a lot more to fill that time than, than just those things. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um Ticketing is part of it as well. With the um, on the supporters club side, that is, um, you know, we um, it's not the the most fun jobs, but uh, quite often the the um, uh, applications far exceed. Um, so you know, I have to sort of juggle uh, numbers on that. So um, ticketing for matches is a big thing. Um, then you're liaising with the uh, visiting club um, that's coming to us, and also when we travel to the away games, um, I'm uh, liaising with my opposite number there um, about things like security. Uh, also, you know, if they're doing special events at the game, anything that changes when clubs come to London, uh, there's ob- quite often. Um, major problems on the transport networks and they're coming from various parts of England they might not be aware of that so you know it's all those sort of things as well then we're doing things like if we're doing a pre-match show uh, the light shows music things like that so um, you know I get involved with that as well Um, it is very wide and varied Um, and so that you know it's good because it keeps the the job interesting Um, you know so it's um, yeah, Lo- loads, loads of different stuff. E- everything basically that you can think of. I, you know, I, I, I do liaise with most of the departments within within the office. Um, you know, and things like partnerships. They might come and ask me about some supporters that they could use in various different locations uh, for some project that they're doing. Um, so I can help them out with that. Um, <laughs> so it, it's bringing everything together, really. And, and then, of course, uh, when dignitaries like David Ziegler or Tiffany Campo come over, uh, you you send the, the the welcoming committee and the, have the parade for them uh, as they arrive in London. That's also part, I would imagine. Yeah, that, that's it. Obviously, yeah, especially for Tiffany, but that's another matter. Well, Tiffany likes herself a parade. She is from New Orleans. <laughs> and all. So, do all the clubs in the Premier League have this large scope of a um, SLO, or is it? you know the top six you know we can't i don't imagine that burnley have a burnley america chapter i mean i'm sure they might but not to the scope and scale i mean is this just because of our global reach or how does that work for other clubs no i think you know my most of the clubs uh do have a global reach now in in maybe in more more of a limited way uh but the premier league tends to spread far and wide um, you know, and some of the, some of the, um, I suppose I hate to say it, but the, the smaller clubs, take, take Burnley for instance, um, you know, I would speak to their, their, their SLO on a regular basis and they might look to be building these areas up. Um, and, um, so, you know, they'll come to us for advice on how to do it, um, who to engage with, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, you know, it, all the clubs really, have got a very wide reach now. Have you? Um, have you? Have do we have a supporters club in Mozambique? Because this podcast probably has eighty percent of their listeners are in Mozambique, and um, we just assume that we should put these people together and and, and get a banner up there. We are the no, official no, so, Arsenal podcast of Mozambique. Yeah. Andy likes to yeah. call it the Beak. Yeah. So yeah, that'd be great. You know, so Mozambique will be. Uh, a country that we haven't got a, a supporters club in. So, um, yeah, we could definitely look to work with them on, on setting it up. I mean, there are guys, you guys there are minimum. You didn't actually take me seriously with that, I hope. But uh, we did have one. <laughs> we, we used to actually look where our listeners came from, and I think we had one that was in Mo- Mozambique, and we spent three weeks talking about how, how huge we are in the peak. Um, Mike, if I'm reading between the lines here, and I think I'm reading correctly, Mark, as, as you do, as I do, Mark is the guy that we need to know to put a Gunas podcast banner up at the end. Oh, you know, I have most of the ideas. You have the best ideas. <laughs> 
That is, uh, yeah, we'll talk offline Mark, about that. Mark, what's the application process? Because I can make a presentation real quick. <laughs> yeah, you can do a PowerPoint. And um, and I actually recall a couple years ago uh, doing an errand uh, for said previous uh, Arsenal America chairperson where I came to a library house with instructions. Uh, you weren't there at the time. Otherwise, we would have met years ago to pick up three yeah. ridiculously heavy banners, lug them to the post office, uh, which is not that close, and um, and and mail them at, at Arsenal America's expense, maybe, uh, back to the States, which didn't seem uber efficient to me, but uh, I lost about seven pounds in sweat that day. So in exchange for that, I think Andy's idea needs to be considered. And we don't like putting people on the spot every week, uh, every single week. Um, but, yeah. yeah. Send me an email and I'll, I'll refuse it anyway. But <laughs> we well, can at least say that we were in the in the process of getting yeah, a banner. Yeah. We'll go through the process. <laughs> we were in the process. We uh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, if that ass fuck can get one with his dogs on it, we should be able to get at least oh, you know something. <laughs> yeah, well, we thought that was really funny though. That one. I was could say I think I know it didn't appeal to everyone. Ours could be the same uh, um, bad boys. Yeah. So that that was uh Raymond from Red Action. So uh you know we like to go one step beyond on these sorts of things. See what I'm exactly. thinking is is uh can I share my screen here, Mike? Here you go. Hold on, let me see here. Uh let's go to this. Part of this podcast. You have all those privileges. Chrome has lost permission to capture your screen. Follow these steps. Oh Andy, work out your tech. Technical difficulties beforehand, <laughs> says the guy who almost single-handedly ruined the last podcast. Wait, who was well, our last podcast with? It was the uh, the Arsenal close-up game where where my internet decided it wasn't working. Oh yeah, I um, I, I was just gonna put up the picture of you. That's the cartoon caricature. Oh, okay. that would be our banner. <laughs> you know what? Hey, that you know, would be a dream. Gonna, we'll do some mock. We'll do some mock-ups and we'll send them over to Mark. We'll spitball. Yeah, we'll spit, we'll spitball some things, and he'll spitball them right back at us. <laughs> yeah. um, so, first of all, and and we have a couple user questions we'll get to in a minute. But uh, uh, again, your help in in supporting uh, Gunners versus Cancer, which is our charitable effort for uh, for leukemia, uh, you know, for fighting uh, against leukemia, and not for leukemia, uh, has been appreciated you uh, and the club have donated Emirates Stadium tour vouchers which hopefully will someday get to be used um, ironically I actually did win bid on two of uh, those vouchers so I used those on Tuesday which I think was the last day that Emirates was open I was sitting in Mar Mikel Arteta's office and then that night found out that he had been diagnosed for coronavirus <laughs> uh, so uh, so I rushed home and and sat in a bathtub for two weeks and turns out I'm okay. But, um, so don't you worry people out there. Uh, but honestly, the, the generosity, the club has donated something really special for next year's campaign, which I'll, I'll be talking about over the summer, but, um, you know, never would have imagined when I connected with a supporters club seven years ago. And when Andy and I started doing this podcast four years ago, that we would really have the, uh, the cooperation and the and the help and the responsiveness from Arsenal itself, and so you know, really, Mark, I just wanted to say thank you for the role you've played in that. Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, as I said, you know, it is a team effort, and it, there's a lot of people behind the back in the background, and um, you know, we we appreciate your support, and um, you know, hope to build on it in years to come. Uh, so, um, yeah. And, and what you're doing for your, your the charity is fantastic. Well, we're just trying to you know trying to do our part and 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 appreciate that not only are we able to leverage the relationship and the community of Arsenal fans, which we don't take lightly, uh, but that there's cooperation back from it. So uh, it is truly the Arsenal way. And I you know I don't know this for sure, but there are some clubs which will remain nameless. And I just, I just can't imagine that spirit of community and togetherness exists in these clubs that are really just more. Uh, when it comes right down to it, I know people say Arsenal is a business. People use that 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 uh, you know over and over again when they're complaining about something. Uh, but uh, when you really dig yeah. deep into some of the other elements of it, rather than just the on the pitch outcome, uh, you know it is much more than a business, and it always has been. So, um, 
one more thing kind of about the relationship with the supporters. I know, you know, in addition to um, the relationship overseas uh, with supporters clubs, there are, you know, some concerns and we hear them every once in a while. Uh, some of them, you know, of course, valid about the game day experience uh, issues from the, the, the regular game day going yeah. fan, the, the, the home and away supporters, the people with season tickets and, and I know that there's been discussions with the supporters forum and, and just generally about how to, you know, improve the atmosphere around the Emirates. I mean, obviously you'll be the first to, to, to recognize that the atmosphere in the Emirates is not the atmosphere that we had in Highbury. It's, it, it's, you know, two and a half times the size. It's very hard to accomplish that, but um, you know, there are a lot of discussions these days about how to improve upon that. So, um, you know, what would you say to the match going fan to, to one who feels like, you know, we want our Highbury atmosphere back? I mean, what, what would you say to them about the work that you're doing and, and, and the response to, you know, to those concerns? Because I, I have seen progress, but I don't want to speak for the fans that are there every week. Yeah, I think um, it's got to come from the fans. That's the thing. Uh, you know, I was part of Red Action um which when we first moved to the emirates uh were very active um and um the thing we found though was that uh, a lot of people uh almost talked a good fight uh when it came down to it um you know they didn't really sort of step up and i know that uh, reaction have had problems for ages in getting volunteers they still have a group of young lads. Um, they're very enthusiastic. They've got some really good ideas. Ashburton um, Army. You have a bit of a trade-off. Yeah, Ashburton Army. A uh, bit of a trade-off there. Sometimes, uh, you know, they can overstep the mark. Um, but they're very young uh, and they really want to succeed. Um, so we're working quite closely with them. Um, there's, there was quite a bit of stuff we were doing just before the break. Um, and so really now I think you're probably more likely to see more from that that, that side of things next season. Um, what I would say to people, though, is though, come enjoy the game, get behind the team, um, and, um, you know, don't listen to the moaners and groaners. Just, uh, you know, do your bit, really. That's all, all we can do. If we all individually do our bit, and we know uh, um, when it is loud there, it is very loud. You know, we've been at a couple of games, well, quite a few games, not just a couple. Um, you know, with Spurs and uh, the Barcelona game, uh, the Man United semi-final for the first 10 minutes before they put us 2-0 down straight away. Um, you know, it can, when it when it goes, it really goes there. And I would all, I, I went to Highbury for many years and uh, it wasn't always a hotbed of uh, support. Well, that's and true. as well, library, I also yeah. say that you go anywhere in the Premier. League. Yeah, well, you know, I, I I don't agree with that. It was it was no better or worse than, and um, you go anywhere. And if the team is not winning, um, Anfield, St James's Park, um, Old Trafford, everywhere is exactly the same. Um, you know, Chelsea's atmosphere is far worse than ours. Um, um, Spurs, you know, the new ground, uh, they will have a few issues with that as well. And um, whenever Arsenal goes to Spurs, obviously it's a big match, so it's always lively. But, you know, speaking to a few well, Spurs, have started Spurs, doing this thing where, Spurs have started doing this thing where at the end of each match, they send a player into the crowd to, to, to greet the, uh, the supporters. Really? I've heard... That was the beginning oh, of yeah, the strategy yeah. to uh, connect <laughs> with your supporters club. Yeah. They're, kind of, uh, they're going for a good uh, political debate. <laughs> so safe standing. Uh, I have a couple questions about it, and I know that it's addressed in the in the in the face to face meetings with the supporters groups. But uh, can you shed any light on on the future of safe standing at the Emirates? Yeah, I think what we've got to bear in mind is when the Emirates was built. Um, the safe standing wasn't even on the on the agenda, um, so it was built as though it was always going to be an all-seater stadium. Mm. Um, 
so of our own. And we've also um, brought in outside um, stadium um, engineers, designers, whatever you would like to call them. And uh, there are a few proposals on the table that we've got, um, but nothing will happen until there's a change in legislation. Um, so, you know, whether it's going to happen soon, I don't know. And, you know, it, at the uh, last election, safe standing was a big issue. It was in all the manifestos uh, for all the parties. But we know what's happened recently. Um, will safe standing still be a priority in the months to come and years to come even? I'm not so sure. Um, but there are some good groups of supporters out there that are pushing in, in the... In, so they will keep it at the forefront of the politicians' minds. Um, there, there's a few um, sort of um, errors, I think, in the way people are thinking. It won't increase capacity, um, and also it won't bring prices down. I know when Glasgow Celtic put their safe standing in, they even looked at increasing prices for that area because of the demand. Mm. Um, so they didn't. They didn't do that, but and you know we wouldn't do it. I wouldn't have thought, but um, you know. So there, there are issues there, and uh, and the thing is as well that with the safety certificate, if we have a safe standing area, um, that means the rest of the stadium will have to sit down. Now, standing in the lower tier tends to move around, and people stand up with it, but you will find that the, the safety people and the uh, local council will be looking to be a lot stricter with the, the actual seated areas. That'll so what happens if you, yeah, if you, if you, if you, if you're in the seated area and you feel like standing, um, the issues on that as well. So there's a lot of, lot of hurdles to go. Um, it will happen, but I don't think it will too too uh, too soon anyway. I, I, I remember two or three years are, ago was. Yeah. I said I would say that I, I, you know I, personally I'm in favour of it, but you know I, I wouldn't want to stand all match now. Uh, I can't sit I, when I'm at the pub. I can't sit down during the match, so I would be all for uh, you know safe standing and um, you know the the. If, I'm reminded when you when you say that everyone else will be asked to sit down. I'm reminded of a Arsenal West Ham game right around this time, two or three years ago. I was there with a couple of people who are in the chat today, Tom and and Rob. Um, we're, our seats, as allocated by Arsenal America, which you know they're always uh, clock end upper, very good view. These particular ones happen to be in the very last row, which was fine. Except when we stood up, we were we were told by stewards to sit back down again, and we're looking behind us, saying, "Is there someone in a like a helicopter that's that's not, not able to see because we're standing up? Because there's no one behind us but air." Um, but I, I'm not going to ask you to comment on that. I've just it, it, it reminded me when you said that you know if there's a safe standing area, everyone else will have to sit down. Uh, yeah. That would be an interesting debate. Um, Andy has a. a, a an idea that he submitted to Arsenal a couple of years ago called dangerous standing. Uh, <laughs> any comment on how that has, has uh, been received? It's uh, where people do parkour during the match uh, around the stadium. And take videos and but, vlogs of themselves doing that. I could tell you a story about that. The, the um, One of the recent games with the uh, Ashburn Army, uh, one of the lads decided to crowd surf when we scored a goal. So the stewards went in and said, you can't do that, and then said, fine. So we scored another goal, and he did it again. Uh, and so he was ejected. And he did actually turn around and say that he didn't realise that crowd surfing would be dangerous and not allowed in the stadium. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the crowd surfing used to happen just organically when we would score a goal. Yeah. And on the terraces, you would end up 20 to 30 feet away from where you started after a goal sometimes. So, I mean, yeah. that's the proper crowd surfing. But, yeah, I guess if you're if you're on top of people, yeah. um, I mean. Well, years ago, in you know, we we're talking back to the 1950s and that uh, and earlier, um, what used to happen was the terraces used to get so packed that they pass any children literally over there. 
hey, front, so the front just clicked. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was a common thing. When they're, they're like 70,000 in Highbury and things like that, they, you know, they, um, in the good old days, as they say. Yeah, that's, that is beautiful. So let's get to some uh, user questions. If you have any more, please put them in here. Um, from Michael Hernandez, this is a good one. As far as you know, uh, does the club have any feelings towards an official Arsenal fan, or I'm sorry, Arsenal football club fan podcast? Um, and for those that are listening rather than watching, he says not talking about AFTV, by the way. Uh, yeah. Something official like, you know, the Gooners podcast by Arsenal. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Um, funny enough, I've just been speaking to the, the media guys um, about – what to do after the, the the imposed break at the minute, and uh, they definitely want to get more involved on with the fans, um, and look at things like fan stories um, and things like that. So, I, I, yeah, I think that's definitely something that we could look at, and um, maybe tell, maybe tell move Dan, forward on that. Tell Dan Tolhurst, tell Mark Ganella, Vini. They all know who we are. We met this summer uh, as media members on the tour. Mm -hmm. Tell them that we are uh, ready and willing to be their American uh, outlet for, uh, you know, for whatever. If they want to, you know, I don't know why, but uh, but yeah, we're we're ready to work with your media team. Let's put it that way. All it's going to uh, cost is one banner. Yeah, <laughs> Andy has a fee. <laughs> now we uh, well, that's not we travel. We'll, we'll expose ourselves to various viruses. Uh, you know, it's it, it's all part of the game. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, and on a serious note, we did talk to, uh, all of the people I just mentioned about, you know, communication. This is well before the season started. This is well before the season stopped. Um, but, uh, you know, communication through new media, uh, you know, not just necessarily sending out sound bites, uh, yeah. and, and interviews through the traditional news media outlets who twist and, and uh, and repackage the words into something that suits them anyway. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of outlets that uh, really can communicate with the fans. Some of them have people on them who put their face right into the right. camera. Yeah, well, tell them, like, tell them we said hi. Yeah, tell them we said yeah, hi. He and, and he, thank you. And uh, and I'm sure he uh, is just Who waiting for my next Mark Ganella. Oh, nice. Uh, for a while, sorry. I was twice a day. <laughs> you know, this is like the worst absolute timing. But um, last week, uh, Mark, um, Mike yelled at me because I left the house to go grocery shopping. So, and he made me feel really bad about it. So I, I, I did an online grocery shop today, and the woman is texting me right now in the store with. I can't get goldfish, you know, the, the little snack cracker things. So she takes me a picture of the shelf. What do you want to replace it? So that's why I'm leading and looking at my text. And my, so I apologize for that. I thought you just were so so chuffed with your new look that you, uh, that you wanted us to get a closer look to that. Yeah. We, we've ha have you, have you done the online shopping? Uh, Mark, is that uh, something that they have over there? Cause we, we, we have groceries coming back. Did we lose him? Uh, bandwidth issues. Oh, no. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah, no. We, yeah, I'm here. You got me? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, so, yeah, we, we, we're struggling with um, delivery times. The, the, the supermarkets just can't handle the uh, um, amount of business they're getting at the minute. And uh, I don't know whether you guys had the same. We, we had a massive run. Uh, that's probably not the right word to use, but on uh, toilet rolls. Mm. That's a... <laughs> what, what, what is that all about? I just don't understand it. And uh, they, uh, everyone was stockpiling toilet rolls. Um, it, so um, I, uh, I read somewhere online that it actually started in Australia. That because they were one of the first oh, waves right. to get it from Asia, they did the stockpile, and it went viral social media obviously and then that and then it just kind of shifted across the, across the globe but it's just crazy it's, it's just it, crazy to me that this woman is texting me things yeah, like i got that one 
I got that once. They were like, which brand of apricots does your wife want? Like, like my yeah, no, like she was just, like my mom really wanted a Cadbury milk fruit and nut bar, and they didn't have any. So I said, well, what else do they have? And she texted me a picture of a roasted almond. Why don't just get that? <laughs> yeah. Don't you just email her? Why don't you just text her back and say, don't you know who I am? I'm doing a worldwide podcast right now for for, for 13 people. <laughs> uh, I can't be bothered with this. Um, all right. Well, and, and as far as the toilet paper thing is, I mean, all you got to do is follow me around for a week and you would understand why someone would stock up on toilet paper during a pandemic. But um, from Michael Hernandez as well, uh, great questions. From him. While we're talking about away games, well, we're not talking about away games anymore, but um, has the club ever reached out to Newcastle and asked for better seats for the away supporters? And I will add to that uh, once you're done answering that. Um, is there ever likely to be any kind of away allocation, even a small one, for, for tickets for away games uh, for overseas supporters groups traveling in? Right. Um, so first part, Newcastle, it is a common... Um, about where they put us in the ground and every other club as well. Um, they say they've got special discipline from the local council. Uh, every every uh, Premier League club now should be hands next to the pitch. Um, but their licence, uh, they're, they're getting special dispensation. So we will pressure um, and um, you know see what we can get. Um, that that's that, that's all I can say on that one. Um, the away matches uh, uh, is pure thing. Um, our away support is is phenomenal. Um, you know we always sell out. Um, and it sells out to uh, away scheme members, season ticket holders. On occasion, we do get a few spare tickets, uh, maybe sometimes it's very short notice. So for the overseas clubs, it's not very practical. Um, but if we get a big then we can help out. Um, Um, uh, on still out, you know, they not a massive opportunity for overseas clubs, but we we will push him. So um, you know, and it's always worth giving us a yeah, shout. It's a, it's a um, brilliant experience. A brilliant experience, but but obviously a very limited opportunity. Sorry, Mike, let's lost you there. It, it's just a brilliant experience to to go to an away game. Um, I, the, the crediting system, I think is very fair. Um, you, you want the people rewarded with the away ticket opportunities to be the ones who go regularly to be the ones who, you know, that's a huge sacrifice, uh, you know, to, to go week in, week out, uh, you know, to those games and, and, and be part of that. So, you know, I get it. I just, I, I wish that the away allocations were bigger just in general, um, but uh, it is what it is, and, and you know we appreciate the, the work you do on ticketing. So, um, any other user questions that we have from Tom? Uh, is the club considering choosing an official song to play before and at, and or after matches? I guess he doesn't really love Neil Diamond that much. Nor does David Ziegler. <laughs> oh yes, there we go. Although we know a few Sweet Carolines, we don't necessarily love the song. Does David Ziegler like anything uh, in life? Yeah, he likes uh, pineapple. Such a long time. I mean, I, I, I was in the I, I was on the original fans forum day one uh, with the club, and um, I, I'm pretty sure this question was. was um, so we do play good old every single game, every home game. Um, the reason behind uh, um, our friend was um, seeing the cup final. Um, we were on 0 to the Arsenal. 
good old R. And we had to think of a third one. And uh, so there was a bit of brainstorming about things. And we said, well, why not try Sweet Caroline just to see? The fact of the matter is, it obviously we won, so everyone was in a good mood. So it was sung. And I would say, after the games now, when it is played, people do sing it. Um, so, um, and there is some tradition there. Um, uh, take it back to the days of the rock. Rocket, when we first moved uh, over to that was the Red Action uh, Bar Pub. We, we started that up, and uh, Groves used to, and um, he would always get up karaoke and swing, swing car, car, find it. It's a rather splendid uh, version, and uh, link there. I, um, mm. You know, they're people. Okay, um, we can't we can't push any song on anybody. Um, it's again, it's got to come from the fans. Um, so if the fans get behind a particular song, then we'll play it. Well, Andy and I are going to make a song um, and uh, and submit that with our banner um, in the long list of of things that end up in the. Uh, in the bin. Um, <laughs> Do you like Eagle Eye yeah. Cherry? Because that's going to be the song. <laughs> it's going to be in the style. It's going to be kind of a mix of James Taylor and System of a Down, I think, is what we're going to look for. Uh, <laughs> stylistically speaking, is concerned. Um, the last question of the day, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll let you go, Mark, because um, you're you're up late tonight with us. Um, silly question, as as Mike's often are, but we love him. Uh, is the club aware it drives a lot of supporters crazy? Now, this doesn't speak specifically for uh, for the Gooners podcast. This is uh, a man's opinion, but drives a lot of supporters crazy when the away kit isn't yellow and blue. Can't go against tradition. What would you say about that? And how much input do you have in the designing of the away kit as the supporters liaison officer? No, no input whatsoever, although I'd like to. Um, I'd agree. Uh, um, yellow and blue is traditional. Uh, um, having said that, if it, it depends how far you want to go back, um, you know, yellow and blue has. It. Um, I think, and and to be honest with you as well, obviously, second and third kits are there to sell uh, the pass um, on a hasn't sold that well. Uh, so purely of you. Uh, you know, I think that's why they try and alternate things a little bit. Um, this, I, I know this, the, the kit this year uh, for various reasons has sold very, very well. Um, I'm not, I'm not aware of what the kits are going to be next season. Um, whether yellow will still be involved, but I'm sure that it will reoccur on a regular basis. Um, but you know, the the first kit is sac sacrosanct, um, and and um, the other two kit, they they play about with a bit. So uh. we're getting a lot of suggestions for system of a down. I mean, you would not have the same atmosphere problems. Uh, I, I'm not sure Maria would love it so much, and some of the other uh, long time supporters. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, I go, I go every week, whereas normally I just wouldn't. Um, okay, so okay, thank so you for your look that one up. I don't even know it. Oh, it's uh, it, it'll get some energy into the stadium. Let's put it that way. Um, music so on. it's um, yeah, it's it's pretty uh, pretty heavy most of the time. We'll uh, I'll, I'll get you into it, and then we'll uh, we'll have a listening party okay. for the next yeah. interview. Um, yeah. Another thank you for for the supporters uh, or supporters uh, for our, our users for uh, for coming to the chat. We've seen Kerry McCollum for the first time in a little while. Michael Hernandez, David Ziegler uh, maintaining his David status uh, when he does good stuff. He's David as opposed to just being David. Uh, Tom Rosenhammer's in here talking about Oasis, which we have no time for. Uh, Rob Ford. Uh, Zachary, 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 always good to see you. Uh, one of the few people I actually got to see while I was over in the abbreviated trip. Um, good and, Kirk. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so thanks for joining us, Andy. Do you have 
Any idea how many shows we've done now in our four seasons? Uh, 400. <laughs> no, we have not done 400. Uh, it feels like 400. This is show 199. That's it? That's it? That, wow. we, we've averaged about 45 a year. Uh, hey, hold on a second, okay? Because the woman can't find juice and nectar's simply grapefruit juice, whatever the fuck that is. Tell her to just make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You, you didn't save me for 200. Uh, well, you know, it was uh, – it, it's randomized. We just we just have some – you know, we pick. But uh, we, we're, we're going to do something amazing for show number 200. We've, we've arranged some outstanding guests in our first 199 shows. I mean, uh, personally, I don't know how you can top Lee Gunner, Andy. But, uh, but for show 200, I've done a madness. What, so uh, we will me. have – joining us live – Arsene Wenger, George Graham, Herbert Chapman, and Unai Emery for a roundtable debate on which of the four of them was the best Arsenal coach of all time. Uh, oh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. You won't want to miss that. Um, it's going to be great. But seriously, we'll, we'll try to do something good for, for show 200. And, uh, and in this day and age where we have no football um, and no one has anything better to do than just sit around and listen to podcasts, uh, it's a great time to check out some of the, the amazing guests we've had in the last couple seasons. You can go to our YouTube page at goonersubscribe.com. Check us out on iTunes or Spotify for the for the audio version. But uh, just a, a sampling of some of the, uh, the people that we've uh, been graced by their presence in the last year, year and a half or so, uh, including Mark Brindle, uh, Lee Dixon, James McNicholas a few times, Sophie Nicola a few times, Amy Lawrence. Uh, we had Arsenal trialist Cole Bassett on earlier this season for an inter uh, interesting interview. Of course, Super Kev, Kevin Campbell, uh, viral girl Jessica from Houston, who, by the way, uh, like many of our uh, our listeners, works in a hospital uh, right now in Houston. So we're praying for for her well being and for uh, for everyone that is close to her in this uh, in this time frame. So. Uh, Simon Collins, Stuart McFarlane from from Arsenal was a great chat. Alan Smith, Arsenal, John Burkow, uh, the Speaker of the House of Commons, like him or not, he was a fun interview. He was good. The late great Dave Faber, Gunnar Hollick, the late great David Ziegler, uh, and and oh, Josh Kroenke uh, was in there as well. Um, so uh, so feel free to, to to see what the craziness is all about and. Uh, and uh, deal with our technical difficulties, which we did have some today. Appreciate you staying with us. But, Mark, uh, any any plugs, anything uh, you'd like us to know in our last minute or so uh, about how to reach you? If you know what, how to experience your your incredible influence on Arsenal personally? Uh, um, you know, I'm always on the end of an email. Uh, M Brindle at Arsenal.co.uk. I'm always happy to talk about Arsenal. Um, you know, I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. Um, but, you know, really, messages at the minute, just for everyone, stay safe. Um, look after yourselves and your families and hope you'll uh, keep healthy. And uh, we'll see you on the other side, obviously. And let's hope that comes sooner than later, although uh, not with Liverpool having won a Premier League. That's my only requirement. So, um, Andy, good luck with your groceries. Thank you. you arrived. I Thank hope your you. various vectors and body lotions. Do they have all the body lotions you ordered? No, that's just, you know, I don't want to go there, Mark. Mike. I, I think what we're going to need to do is go to Amazon for the personal items, you know. Personal <laughs> personal hygiene items. <laughs> Especially for Mark, thank you. Andy, thank you. Hey, thanks, thanks to the Mark, users. Uh, we'll see you soon for show number 200.